<laughs> so I hope you are kind of enjoying it. <laughs> so it's different. It's hard if you, especially if you had lunch and you're a bit tired already, and then you have to listen to something which is a little bit more profound than usual. It kind of makes it difficult. Yeah, I know what it's like. So uh, you just have to, I guess, try to go with the flow and see what happens. Uh, uh, but a lot of this is going to get much more interesting and practical later on, uh, once you start to see how it kind of holds together. But there is, uh, I think, useful to understand the overall process in a bit of detail before we go get on to the more uh, practical applications of this. So we have now come up to feeling. Yeah, it's already factor seven independent origination as a consequence of contacting the world. Uh, you have to feel, yeah, that was what happens. You feel good, bad, or neutral. Uh, these are the tones of experience. Feeling is not about emotion, but about the tones of experience. <coughs> so we have these three tones. So uh, <coughs> feeling is a very important factor on the Buddhist path. I think I have probably spoken about this before, it is very important because feeling is what gives life meaning. Yeah. Yeah, this is really where meaning comes into the picture, this is where the idea of what we have to get in the world, what we have to do, what we have to strive for comes. Everything only has value and meaning as far as feeling is concerned. Uh, it is feeling that gives value to anything. What, why is it that we pursue certain things? Uh, why is it that we do anything? Because it re is related to positive feelings uh, or the overcoming of negative feelings. It gives value to life, value to anything. If we didn't feel anything, uh, everything would be the same. There would be no way to make a judgment, yeah? If you uh, saw colors and you didn't think one color was better than the other one, it would all be kind of bland, it wouldn't have any meaning. Yeah? So feeling is really the thing that drives human beings and everything. It gives us values, purpose, goals, aims, and everything in our life revolves around these feelings. And that is why feeling is such an important part of uh, uh, this path and why it is such an important part of the Buddha's teachings, precisely because it gives this rise to values and everything. Yeah. So it is like a pivotal point, if you like, independent origination and so many things. And if you contemplate feelings properly, that is often enough to reach awakening in the suttas. Uh. And the reason why feelings is problematic is, of course, that they cannot be controlled. Yeah? This is where the problem is. Ultimately, what we want is positive feelings, but we can't have it all the time. This is precisely the problem of samsaric existence. You cannot control this. This is what we're talking about all the time, about dukkha and uh, anatta and all of that. And because you can't control it, there will always be a certain amount of unpleasant feelings in any kind of existence. And this is the problem. And uh, so our, we're always searching for this. This is what gives value to life. But at the same time, that value, that thing we're searching for, cannot be achieved. And uh, so this is, uh, we need to, uh, if you get, understand this, this, you really understand a lot of the problem of samsaric existence. Uh, and because feelings is so varied, because it's always changing, always moving around. That is why the next factor of dependent origination arises. Craving comes as a consequence of feeling. Uh, if you have a preference for happy feelings, which is obviously everyone has, and you have a dislike for unpleasant feelings, uh, which everyone has, uh, then uh, you are going to have craving that drives you towards one, drives you away from the other one. Uh, yeah, and this is how craving arises in the world. Uh, if there is neutral feeling, well, when neutral feeling, uh, it depends on how you approach it. Uh, approach neutral feeling in the wrong way, it seems really boring. Yeah, neutral feeling, I don't want that. I, want to, I don't feel alive when I feel neutral feeling. So if you have neutral feeling, you're usually repelled by it. But if you practice the path properly, uh, all the way to the jhana states, Neutral feelings become something very beautiful, uh, and actually they become one of the highest experiences you can have uh, when you have a really profound neutral feeling. Uh, so it depends on your relationship to the neutral feeling, whether it's good or bad. Uh, so this is where craving arises. Yeah? So this is a very important inflection point on this thing, feeling giving rise to craving. Uh, 
And uh, very often what you will hear, you know, what, a very common thing to hear in Buddhist circles is that, is that at this point that you break dependent origination between feeling and craving, because you stop that relationship between cr feeling and craving, so you stop craving for those feelings. That's, this is where you break it. You still have to feel, feeling is com compulsory, can't get away from feeling, yeah. but what is not compulsory is the craving that comes afterwards. Yeah. So this is the often said thing. Yeah, you, this is where dependent origination is broken. Huh? But this needs to be understood. This needs to be, a, this is not an, a full truth of what is happening here. Yeah. It is true that it sort of can be broken here. You can stop craving here. Yeah. But it's how you do it that really is the critical thing to understand. Uh. And there are a number of steps. Yeah, and this is what the path of practice is all about, is this ability to kind of learn how to reduce the craving based on those feelings and eventually eliminate the craving altogether. It happens at this point, but it happens, it must happen in the right way. You have to understand the process. And it is not enough just to be mindful. Yes, with mindfulness it's going to help you a lot because mindfulness will inform you that certain mind states are about to arise, certain feelings are about to arise, and you can then change your attitude so that craving doesn't arise. This is one of the most important things we were talking about earlier, about sense restraint, about understanding that anger, ill will, is about to arise because of certain feelings, and then you change your perception of that person, of that situation, and suddenly anger does not arise anymore. <coughs> Craving, uh, that craving which is based on, uh, which gives rise to anger, that craving itself is gone. Yeah, you see that person, but you no longer crave to get rid of them just because they are unfriendly or because you find them difficult. Uh, you understand them in a different way. You understand them as a suffering being. You understand them as a conditioned process or whatever. Yeah. And you have compassion for them because you understand that they are trapped in their own delusion or whatever it is. I've talked about this quite a bit already. Yeah. But you can see here how that by changing your view of what is going on, by under changing the underlying avidja, that's really what you're changing. When you change the underlying avidja, feeling doesn't give rise to craving here. So a lot of the reduction in craving here happens as a matter of course when you practice the path, when you restrain yourself, when you are wise about what is going on. You kind of reflect more carefully, yeah? Then craving goes down. When you understand that that you know new thing that you want to buy or you're going to have, it is not as exciting as you thought it was going to be. Yeah, then uh, again you don't have that same kind of craving for this thing because you understand that happiness probably lies more in a different area, more in mental development than in accumulating uh, objects of the world or material things, if you like. And so wisdom is the underlying thing, the reduction of uh, avidja is really the kind of critical issue which enables you to not react to those feelings with craving here. So this is what we do. So you can see here how there is, we are sep gradually separating away feeling from craving in this way, by being wise about how we live, uh, by reacting to the world around us. And mindfulness is a critical factor here because it informs us uh, of when we are going astray. And then we change our attitude, we change our approach. Uh, and gradually, as a consequence, the mind becomes more peaceful. Uh, there's less craving in our life, more stability. We go through life in an even way, yeah? Like this kind of flowing through things. Uh, they talk about flow these days as a synonym for the idea of being mindful. When a good sports person, they just flow through the golf course, yeah? Hitting that golf. And are there any golfers here? Uh, yeah, I have one golfer over there. Okay, the golfer is here. So, uh, uh, yeah, when you kind of get in that flowing rhythm, I, I've never really played much golf, but uh, you, apparently you get into this flow. Yeah, you flow through the golf, or maybe through the tennis match, or whatever it is. Uh, and then it's easy because it's automatic. It's like a process happening. You don't feel that you're exerting your will or whatever. That's being living mindfully in that sense. Uh, and then you reduce your craving, but th you can never eliminate craving at this point. Uh, you can keep on being mindful and mindful and mindful for the rest of your life, uh, not reacting to the external 
stimuli in a certain way, but you can never eliminate it. it what you have to do ultimately to eliminate it yeah, is to see the problem deeply, understand a vidya, give rise to vidya and understanding instead. That's what you have to do, that's the only way. So, and the reason for that is because you have to understand that these feelings never will give you any happiness. Yeah, when you understand the root problem of that you're looking for happiness in the wrong place, uh, that you cannot control it, you understand non-self, uh, when these two things become clear to you, you will stop once and for all to seek any happiness in those feelings, uh, and then craving will stop, because you know craving can never deliver what it's supposed to deliver, uh, and therefore craving will stop. So craving stops ultimately by way of insight. Uh, you reduce the problem more and more through mindfulness and clear awareness and all of that uh, until your mind is completely pure. Uh, and then when your mind is completely pure, uh, then uh, you have the ability to go into samadhi, then you understand the nature of reality, then craving stops. <coughs> <coughs> craving stops from insight ultimately, not just from restraint. Uh, mindfulness is not enough. Uh, insight is what is really required at this stage. Uh, so when we talk about breaking dependent origination at this point, that is what it means. It doesn't mean that you can just be mindful and then hope that it will stop completely on that basis. <coughs> yeah, mindfulness always has to have some wisdom to it. Yeah, yeah but you need the samadhi. Otherwise, the wisdom will not be deep enough. <laughs> okay. Yes, please, Wajin. Um, sorry, but uh, Venerable Lady, when you said mindfulness, uh, it implies wisdom? Is that what you said? I couldn't hear what you said just Mindfulness now. Mindfulness and wisdom. Um, just a question. Mm. If you say mindfulness, does it imply the first six factors of the noble uh, Sama Samasati does yes. imply the first six factors, yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so it will always come with a certain degree of wisdom, mindfulness, but it's not enough in its own right. Uh, you need to take it to the level of samadhi to be able to really penetrate fully, you have to see all the way down to the bottom of things. Uh, so it w it's helpful, but it's not going to go all the way here. So, uh, um, let's go back to the definitions again very quickly. If you go to the uh, page 38, uh, and again the, all of these uh, definitions, uh, just to kind of back up some of the things I said. Uh, so you see there, after name and form, you have the six sense fields. Uh, the sense field of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and the mind are the six sense fields. So this is the, all the six senses, as I mentioned. All experience happens through these six senses. Uh, it's impossible to have any experience apart from that. Uh, so because of that, all the contact we have with the world happens through those six senses. Yeah? That's what the next one is about, contact, six classes of contact, through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. All experience happens through that kind of contact. There is no experience apart from that, those kind of contacts. And because you experience through those six sense bases, the contact, then the six feelings arise through all of those uh, six sense bases. Yeah? Feelings can be classed in many ways. In the suttas there's all kinds of different classes of feelings. Uh, you can uh, also class it as um, painful feeling, neutral feeling and happy feeling. Uh, you can class it as past feeling, future feeling uh, and present feeling. Uh, yeah? This is how it is classed in the suttas. Uh, so if you multiply three types of feelings, uh, yeah, times uh, in the past, present, future, times three types of uh, happy, neutral and dukkha, that's nine, times six senses, nine times six is fifty-four, uh, yeah, and then you can multiply that by two because you have mental and bodily feeling that you get a hundred and eight. Uh, 
And 108 is this kind of number you will hear in Buddhism often, yeah? 108 is kind of one of those numbers. Uh, and that comes from the 108 kinds of feeling. It's just a way of thinking about feeling in different ways. Uh, so you can expand and contract, uh, look at this in different ways. It doesn't have, it's not a very important set, it just kind of goes, fits with the sequence that you see here. It happens through those six senses. Uh, and then you have craving. Craving then arises then through those six senses as well. So you have craving for all of these things, yeah? And you know what that means. You can crave food, you can crave for sights, you can crave for touches, you can crave mental states, especially when you get into meditation, you start craving that meditation. Wow, so nice. I want it back. Well, that's the problem. You can't get it back again. So that's, <laughs> that's often what, how things go. So that is then how craving arise. And I will talk a lot more about the connection between feeling and craving later on because it is, this is a lot of the work is done right there. A lot of the oh, making the mind even happens at this point. If we keep on reacting to feelings all the time, the mind is always going to be zigzagging in this way and is never going to be stable. And that is one of the biggest problems for the human mind. And then you're never going to make that progress uh, that you want on the path. So dealing with that is just so important, uh, especially dealing with anger. If you can become more of a caring, non-angry person, wow, you are going to be such a blessing for yourself and a blessing for everyone around you. It's just one of the most wonderful things you can do for the world, is to become that kind of person. Uh, yeah, please ask, yeah, fire away. Ajahn, coming back to, yeah. just now you mentioned the numbers. Yeah. How important are the numbers? You mentioned it's not important. So if it's not important, yeah. is it just for mere, I just know this plus this plus times this plus this equals to 108, yeah. that's enough? Or I actually have to memorize it and use it, I don't know, in which part of the cultivation? May I know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Don't have to, don't have to memorize it because... Uh, uh, the, the idea is the main idea just to understand how feeling gives rise to craving, yeah, and that's easy to understand. And in a sense, you can understand that sometimes it is past feeling that gives rise to craving because you think about something in past and that gives rise to craving. Sometimes you have a fantasy about the future that gives rise to craving, yeah. Sometimes it's the present moment, and that's really all it means. It just shows that craving feeling exists in so many different areas, and you crave according to wherever it is. Uh, or craving can be, you can crave happy feelings, or you can anti-crave <laughs> negative feelings, yeah? You can be averse to negative feelings, or you can crave the neutral feeling after a very powerful samadhi state. Uh, so all of these feelings, or it can be craving for the eye feelings, or the feelings through the nose. That's really all it means. So you don't need to classify. All you need to know is whether you are craving for that feeling or not. That is really the problem. Uh, so the point, the Buddha is just trying to point out here that uh, the diversity of craving based on feeling is very, very broad and is very varied and everything is counted in. There's no feeling that is outside of this system. All feelings are included, that's really the point. But you don't have to go home and think, one, okay, I can remember one feeling, two, I can only get to 107, one is missing, oh no, I can't be enlightened. No, it isn't like that, yeah, you can still be enlightened, yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, uh, that's the uh, six classes of craving, based on those six classes of feelings. Uh, so let's just leave that aside. I'm going to talk, talk much more about this later on, uh, but uh, for now, just leave, leave it to one side and just take you through to the very end of uh, uh, this particular sutta one more time. So then, from those classes of craving, we then have grasping. And grasping in Pali is called upadana. And upadana means quite literally taking things up. Yeah? And you know what it's like in English. The, the English word taking things up can mean many things. It can literally mean taking up like this, like picking up, yeah? taking something up. Yeah? And then you have to use the opportunity to have a drink at the same time. Yeah? <laughs> So you t take something up, this is one thing that it means, it, it's a kind of a very temporary taking up. Uh, but in English we also use the word taking up in a more metaphorical sense. 
you take up a sport, you take up a practice, you take up a teaching, you take up a job, you take up a relationship. All of this, not a literally taking up, like you take it up with your hands, but it's a metaphorical one. We do things, we get involved with things. And this is really what this is about, is that involvement of the mind in something uh, which then is done to help you satisfy your cravings. Yeah? This is really what this is all about. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on today, this taking up is really everything we do in life is somehow revolved, uh, goes around this, because we crave for sensual pleasures, uh, we do things that support that experience of sensual pleasures. Uh, that's why we have a home, as I mentioned before. Yeah, home is a place where you can feel at ease and relax and chill out and play video games or, or watch the TV or do some other entertainment and sleep nicely and all of these kind of things. That's what happens in a home. A home is a place where you can enjoy, basically, be part of the sensual realm in a pleasant way. So you take up living in a home. It's dukkha to be homeless, right? To sleep under a bridge, you don't really want to do that. A lot of people do that around the world these days, and it's a terrible thing that this should be some... Uh, do you have homeless people in Malaysia as well? Yeah? It's terrible, isn't it? Uh, it is something that we really need to solve as a society. I don't know how we can accept having homeless people. Uh, often they are mentally sick people. They are people who really haven't got a chance in life. And then we don't look after them. I think it's terrible. And I, I know that in some of the... Scandinavian or Nordic countries like Finland, they've actually tried to start to re resolve the homeless crisis. Uh, yeah? It's a bit of a sidetrack from dependent origination, but uh, you know, it's all related to each other. So, uh, and all they are doing, very simple, they have built simple housing for the homeless people and then they have given them support to overcome their problems and gradually get them, them back into the labor market again. And it's very successful. Uh, if you have a certain trust in people, uh, and people usually want to be do the right thing if they're given a chance. Uh, most people want to do the right thing in the world. Uh, most people are not kind of born criminals. Uh, and uh, give them a chance, uh, and they will work out. Uh, and often we don't give people enough chance. So really we need to be more caring, I think, in our societies, and look after the people who drop out like that, and, and support them. Uh, so they also have a chance to take up a home, otherwise they will have even more dukkha. They can, okay, at least they can, and then eventually when they understand that taking up a home also wasn't that satisfactory, then they can be Buddh become Buddhist. Uh, they can come here, listen to the teaching, and become arahants. Uh, but if they keep on sleeping under the bridge, uh, they have no chance. Is that right? Is that how it works? <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, so f that's, that's how you elevate someone from sleeping under the bridge uh, to becoming an arahant. It may take a while, but uh, eventually that's how it goes. Uh. That's the theory. The practice, I'm not sure about. Uh. Uh, sorry, Ajahn. Yeah, please. But what you said just now is very funny because yeah. you, you say you want to solve the problem of homelessness mm. and then you elaborate all the ways and up to the point where they become arahant. So isn't arahant part what you call homeless people? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, that's a good point, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you, co you go back to where you started, in a sense. Yeah. But you see, the attitude is different. Yeah. This, this is the whole difference. The attitude is different. So you go back, but you don't really go back. Yeah. But it's almost like you go full circle. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this is. Some people have actually complained that anag anagaria should not be translated as homeless because it sounds like you're sleeping under a bridge, right? That's what it <laughs> So maybe we should, some people have said we should translate it as houselessness instead of homelessness uh, to kind of get a more neutral word. So maybe that's true. Uh, but that is quite funny, right? <laughs> that's a good point. Uh. So, th so this is what this grasping upadana is about. It's about taking up things, all the, the how, if you think about how you live your life, uh, all the things that you do in your life, that is all the things you have taken up. Yeah? It shapes your life, it makes you who you are as a person, all of these things. Uh. So, um, the sutta, the here, the definition here on page 38, it gives specifically four types of grasping. Uh. And the first one is the grasping at sensual pleasures. Uh. So this is all the things that you take up in that sensual realm. Yeah? 
and a lot of those things will be all those things I was just talking about before. The majority, the vast majority of grasping will be that kind of grasping, yeah, that relate to that sensual realm. Hobbies that you take up, interests that you have, often related to sensuality, yeah, going to restaurants or whatever it is that you enjoy, yeah, going to see movies and all of these things is part of that, uh, especially when you take it up in a bigger, bigger way. Uh, and all of these other things as well. Even your work is really part of this uh, grasping at sensual <coughs> <coughs> pleasures. So all of that comes under that. Uh, um, and uh, then you have the grasping at views. And uh, so this is uh, really all the views that we have about the world. Uh, yeah, We tend to hold on to our views. Uh, have you, you probably noticed that, everyone notices that, how we hold on to our views. Often that can be political views, it can be views about anything really. This is Ditti Upadana, of course here it relates mostly to religious views, but it can also go out about views about anything, views about which which team is better yeah, in, in sports, people can argue about almost anything. Yeah. And very often it is arguments about views that is, uh, is happens in the world. Uh, the Buddha makes an interesting distinction. He makes the distinction that the uh, lay people more often argue about sensual pleasures, whereas um, monastics more often argue about views. Uh, yeah? So when I argue with Venerable Aya over here, uh, we argue about views. Uh, yeah? This is uh, this teacher is right. No, what? You can't say that. This other teacher is better. So she will tell me that Venerable Buddha Dasa, he is the best. He got it right, uh, and I will say no. Ajahn Brahm is the best one, uh, and then we can argue argue about it, which which views are correct. Uh, actually, we don't argue that much because we don't we don't talk that much, so we don't really have a chance to argue. So that's <laughs> we are lucky in that sense. So it's not a problem. Uh, but this is often true. Yeah, if you look at the monastic world, boy, this argument about views is just big. Isn't that right, uh, Aya? People argue about. Or, or discuss views anyway, and sometimes ending into in arguments. Do you have that the nuns, or is it only the monks who are so stupid to argue about views? Uh, not sure. Okay, don't want to answer. Okay, it's okay. Don't have to answer. Yeah, you got, if you have anything to say, you can say later on. Uh, but uh, very common. Yeah, and it's kind of natural because this is your, this is what your life is about. It's about dhamma, so it's natural that you want to discuss views. And sometimes, of course, it ends up being. Uh, a bit heated. Yeah, that's kind of the nature of discussing things. <laughs> so uh, view is very important and uh, you can see here that it, you don't have the precepts and observances and then you have theories of a self and theories of a self is a subclass of those views. Uh, uh, they are a particular type of views concerned with the self. And this is one of the most important kind of views, that's why it is separated out specifically. Uh, and this is where the idea of religious views comes from. Uh, and uh, the most important of those views, uh, there are a large number of them, you can go to the um, uh, Sabhasava Sutta, the second sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, to find some of those views there, they're quite kind of elaborated on there. Um, uh, and uh, but you can also go to the um, uh, Brahmajala Sutta, the first Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, which gives you 62 different kinds of wrong views. Uh, so it's elaborate at great length the kind of views you can have. I'm not going to go into that because that would take us another week to go through all of those views. Uh, but it comes really down to two kinds of views, uh, and that is the uh, eternalism and annihilationism. This is the standard views of the world that everyone has. Uh, and you will be surprised, I'm, I'm sure you know already, how people grasp onto these views very strongly. Uh, if someone believes in an eternal life, usually it means they also believe in a God. Uh, yeah? If you challenge them, they're not going to take that lightly. Uh, they're going to hold on to those views very strongly. So if you want to challenge somebody who has a certain view about God, you have to go about it in a very gentle way in an indirect way, so they don't even know that you're challenging them. Yeah, You're just kind of giving them a different way of looking at things. Uh, but the people hold on to this thing very, very strongly. Uh, and because it's part of their identity, part of who they are, it is part of what they crave for, they crave that security. Uh, remember, this is also about mental objects, the craving here. Yeah, so When you take up that view, it's because it gives your life a sense of meaning, of purpose, uh, a sense of identity. All of these things that you are interested in, uh, they are held up by that view. Uh, 
So it's not so much that the view itself is important, it's more like what it does for your craving and your feeling about yourself. That is why these views are important. It comes from craving, that's why we have these views. So the views are kind of, uh, it's strange, isn't it? We have views about things and we think that they are important, but actually often they are just based on our feelings and cravings, that's where it all comes from. Uh, so how solid is it? It's very ephemeral, very dodgy, all this holding together very badly here. Uh, and sometimes we just, if you want to penetrate through that, uh, we have to really see why we are doing things, to see whether our views arise from craving or whether they really are solidly based. Uh, and very often, most of the time, we will find that our views are fundamentally based on feelings. Uh, what makes us feel good? And then we take up that view. Eternalism. I need to believe in a God. A God makes me feel secure. It's like having a mummy or daddy in the sky who kind of looks after me if something goes wrong. Uh, and of course, it's very tempting. Yeah, it's nice to have a big mother or daddy who looks after you. Uh, it's nice if it's true. But if it isn't true, it's problematic. Uh, because then you believe in something which is empty, uh, something which actually isn't there when you need it. Uh, and of course, then it's a problem. And it's leading you astray. Uh, and you don't have that security there. Uh, so it matters enormously to get it right. Uh, and yet somehow it is hard for people to kind of give that up. Uh, I always found it, I remember I, when I was a child I also believed in God. Yeah, you grow up in that kind of society and it's kind of, you know, you believe in these things, but then there comes a point in your life, for me, then I just completely rejected the idea. One day I woke up, I thought, why am I believing in this? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, gone, it never came back again. And from that on, the whole idea of a creator God made absolutely no sense to me. Yeah. And that was kind of liberating, yeah, liberating from something which uh, I realized was just conditioned into you as a child, part of a society, and then one day you're able to kind of break out of that conditioning, and that's very liberating. It's just a view that you grow up with. So views are very strong, and on the other hand you have the annihilationist view. Also people hold very strongly, the kind of the modern day atheist movements, you know, uh, Dawkins, uh, Richard Dawkins and those kind of people uh, who you may may have heard about, very, very famous biologist, and of course he was a brilliant biologist, but he's also a very hardcore atheist, probably too hardcore. He doesn't appreciate the spiritual side of existence. He doesn't say much bad about Buddhism. Most of the time he says bad things about Christianity and Islam and that sort of thing. But uh, if he knew Buddhism, probably would uh, say bad things about Buddhism as well, I don't know. But uh, Buddhism is a bit different, so you, you think about it in a different way. But these people are just as strong in their atheism, almost, as other people are in their religion. They are so convinced that when you die, everything is just gone when you die, and that's it. Yeah, that is kind of their conviction. And uh, they, uh, this is the annihilationist doctrine. And also very strong. And it based also on a kind of craving. And sometimes it is just the craving that your life has been so unpleasant, you actually want to end it. Yeah, it can be that kind of craving, or it can be more like a craving that comes from ideas, like maybe Richard Dawkins, uh, that all your world view is built up that way, and for that reason you hold on to that view. So these, you, you grasp onto these views. These views become part of your identity of who you are, and then for that reason they become very strong. And so I recommend you as Buddhists, be a Buddhist, but don't be someone who is too hard in your views. Be gentle about your views. Understand the uncertainty of your views. Yeah? Don't hold them too hard. Don't allow yourself to be, uh, you know, uh, to be converted by Christians or Muslims or whatever. That's not really the point at all. Yeah? But th because you realize those Christians and Muslims, they probably know even less than you. Huh? So why should you allow them to convert? That doesn't make any sense. All it means is that you, are, you know that we should all be more humble about our views, including Buddhists, because we often don't know. And when you are more humble about your views, you get into less arguments. Yeah, when people challenge you about rebirth, you just shrug your shoulders, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't really know for sure. This is what I believe in because it seems to make sense. But, uh, you know, you know that the other person doesn't know either, so you don't have to kind of change your mind or anything. 
It just means you avoid the arguments and the problems very often. Hold your views lightly here. Don't hold them hard. And when you hold them lightly, you also allow them to evolve over time, to become better, even more solid. Yeah, you get new ways of looking at it. And that evolution of your view is part of what the path is like. You allow yourself to be changed according to as you understand the suttas and the Dhamma, and also as you understand yourself as time goes on. Yeah, this is how gradually the whole thing uh, uh, moves forward. Uh. So, uh, <coughs> this is the taking up of uh, views, yeah, and, and uh, uh, political views, and everything really is included, included in this. So, be, be gentle with all of these kind of things. Uh, political views are so kind of uncertain and often so dodgy, we don't really know what's happening very often. Uh, so, hold those even lighter than your. Uh, spiritual views, uh, because uh, uh, it's just too hard to know sometimes. And then you have the precepts and observances, uh, yeah, which is here correctly translated by Ajahn Sujato. Uh, sila Bhatta is the Pali for this, uh, and Sila is the um, uh, virtue, yeah, on the Buddhist path, uh, and uh, Vatta is observances. These are things you do, yeah to gain some outcome, you observe a certain way of being. For example, if you come here to wear white uh, during the retreat, yeah, you're kind of observing something. Yeah? You're using a vata, it's an observance to wear white and keeping the eight precepts. And you look much more pure and beautiful when you wear white, right? Uh, it looks nice. Uh, and I remember sometimes I've been to Sri Lanka, I go to Sri Lanka every few years and I usually give a talk in something called the BMICH, which is a big convention center right in the center of Colombo. It's really large and the main hall there seats over 2,000 people. Uh, so when I give a talk to 2,000 people, it's really quite amazing. Uh, you have this little monk and there's this ocean of people in front of you. Uh, and because it's on the Uposada day, everyone wears white. Uh, it's really, really beautiful. Everyone in the whole hall wears white, uh, yeah? And they're sitting there, uh, and it gives this beautiful sense of, I don't know, there's some, something in these observances which actually is quite beautiful and very, it actually feels pure when you are there. It's, it's quite nice, uh, because obviously white has this, this effect. Uh, so there is a, an impression it makes on the mind, yeah? And that's obviously part of this. So uh, these, some of these ancient traditions, they have some effect in that sense, I suppose. Uh, so, sila bhatta, the idea here is not to, again, grasp these things too much. It means, one, one of the main things that this means is that uh, you, uh, <coughs> you understand that these things don't lead to awakening in their own right. They are just part of the path and not the full path. So, you, uh, you, you grasp them a little bit, but you don't grasp them too hard. And uh, you have to grasp precepts a little bit. Uh, and the reason why you have to grasp them a little bit uh, is because uh, if you don't grasp them at all, you're not going to follow them. Yeah? It's as simple as that. Uh, because craving will always get in the way, and then when craving gets in the way, you will give up the precepts. Uh, so the grasping is what stops you. The attachment to the precept is what stops you from allowing them to be broken all the time. Uh, some degree of grasping is actually required there, but you are quite light about it, you're not too strong about it. You don't hold on to these things you know, for dear life. If, you, uh, if there is some serious problems, occasionally you are flexible with the precepts because you know that being completely adhering to it in the wrong way can often cause more problem and it may actually go on the wrong way on the path if you, if you do it that way. Uh, so you are wise about how you use this. Uh, now, one of the things that it says in the suttas is that it's only the sotapanna who does not grasp at precepts. Yeah, it, is, uh, it says there that um, sila, s s yeah, slipata paramas are true, but it's the opposite. Yeah? So, this, so the sotapanna is uh, apparamatta, silani ar apparamatta, which means not clung to. So here it is silabata paramasa, this is what we're kind of seeing here, where you hold on to those things. But the stream mentor is called someone who is, is silani apparamatta or apparamatani, which means not, you don't cling to these things. So it shows it's only when you become a stream mentor that you actually give up that clinging. Yeah? So sometimes people think that the path to stream entry is to give up 
all of these graspings and all of these clingings and the and the including the desire for these things but this is not really the path yeah the path truly is to give up uh, your um, uh, craving for the sense pleasure the sense pleasure is really the most important thing here uh, but the giving up of grasping to the precepts and observing especially precepts is actually the outcome of the path it is not the practice uh, so don't think that the practice is not to grasp the precepts because if you think that you won't be able to practice the path properly so grasp the precepts enough to keep them don't grasp them so strongly that you make it into a powerful view which then becomes all consuming and maybe you even find fault with others for not doing it properly or whatever grasp them lightly enough to support you but don't think that giving up that grasping is part of the practice of the path. It is part of the outcome of the path. And this is two very important distinctions to distinguish between those things that support the path that you have to do to practice and those things that are the outcome of the path. Yeah, the outcome, we have to allow them to happen, occur on their own as a result of the practice. We can't make them happen through practice. And uh, uh, not grasping to virtue or to precept and uh, rouse is an outcome it's not something you do so what you do is actually grasping a little bit uh, and then the grasping ends once you become a sotapanna why does it end when you become a sotapanna because when you become a stream enter this is all internalized you have seen the dhamma you know that Virtue is fundamental to living a good life because you know it so fully and completely here. You cannot break it anymore. Yeah, it's like you, you know that that hot plate is hot. There's no way you're going to put your hand on it if you know it's hot. Yeah, you're going to keep your hand away. Why would you put your hand on a burning hot hot plate? You don't. Not going to do that. You keep your hand away. In the same way, a stream mentor is incapable of transgressing in certain ways the, the, the precepts because they know it's hot. It is dukkha. There's no way they're going to go there. This is what it means to see these things properly here. Yeah. Only then, because it's internalized, they no longer grasp them. It happens. They are virtues uh, by, uh, by virtue of their uh, personality, which has changed. Uh, that's why they are virtuous. Uh. So this is all the various kinds of grasping, and some of these graspings you have to keep on for a little bit longer, so the one about uh, <coughs> precepts and observances, you keep on grasping a little bit until you become a stream enter. The grasping to sensual pleasures, you try to reduce as much as possible right in this life because it is really problematic and it stops you from attaining anything. The grasping to views and uh, uh, and the theories of self, well, you you start to reduce them as well in a meditation practice uh, but your views are only also only really given up fully once you become a stream enter that's when that grasping is given up fully uh, sensual pleasures the grasping to that is only given up when you become a anagami a non-returner uh, that is when that is finally given up uh, but uh, the main thing to focus on here, the one thing that really matters the most, is always sensual pleasures. Uh, that is the most sticky one, and its opposite, ill will, which always go together with sensual pleasure. Yeah? So you give up those, gradually give up those things. Uh, how do we do that? I will tell you more about that later. I've already said quite a bit about it before. Uh, it's just understanding the unreliability uh, and the uncertainty of that sensual world uh, and after a while you just lose your interest naturally it gradually fades over time because you understand there's nothing to be found there which is really satisfactory uh. it's very beautiful when that happens you start to feel more content yeah you feel more happy uh. your meditation becomes deeper uh. you start to feel real peace inside this is the consequence of giving up that sensual world stage by stage in this way uh. okay <coughs> then uh, uh, all of this grasping uh, it means that we live our life in a certain way yeah we now our life has a very definite direction think about your own life it's quite full yeah it has all these things that you have to do and basically most people if you look at their lives it is full from the morning they wake up to they go to the bed they have like a schedule things they do you get up you get dressed and you 
uh, have your breakfast, or maybe I don't know if you have. Maybe some people might have a shower in the morning, and then you go to work, or maybe you take your kids to school first, and then maybe you go to work, and then there's schedule after schedule on the weekend or on the weekdays. Maybe you come here to the BGF, or uh, and then you have your meditation time. Uh, you know, life is like tick 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 full, yeah. And all of that is really all your upadanas, all the things you have. This is what your shape of your life takes, because you have taken up all of these things. And the idea behind all of this is then to satisfy you one way or another. And that is your bhava, that is your existence. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult to know what your bhava actually is. Yeah, it can be hard to really figure that out. And the way I would recommend you to understand your le own level of existence, uh, where your mind is at, what you really are interested in, sometimes people think that they are very spiritual. Yeah, I practice spirituality very deeply and all of that. Uh, and of course, it is very admirable even to be a little bit spiritual, even to keep the five precepts, even to kind of have an intention is, is wonderful. Uh, but to understand how deeply you have gone, uh, See what your mind is inclining towards. Uh, where is your mind taking an interest? This is the critical thing. Uh, and the time to find that out is very often in meditation practice. Uh, because when you sit down, uh, when you relax, uh, when you let go of all your immediate concerns, when you allow the tiredness of the mind to dissipate and disappear, what are you left with? Uh, when you go to Jhana Grove and you stay there, many of you have come there for a few weeks even, yeah? After the first few days, when you kind of left most of the thoughts of, uh, most of the uh, kind of momentum that you bring with you from home life, you have kind of let go of that momentum uh, and you're calming down a little bit, uh, what is left in your mind at that point uh, after you really calm down and you let go of most things? Uh, and what is left in your mind at that point is really your bhava, what is your natural inclination of the mind, yeah? And you will find that for some of you, <coughs> you keep on thinking about the same old things, yeah? You keep on thinking about your family and your job and about these things, and the reason why you do that is because that is where your existence is at. Uh, or you think about the pleasure, certain pleasures in life, uh, yeah? That is what your life is all about. Your mind is focused on that. It is attached to those things. The upadana is still very strong. Uh, and then you have an idea of uh, the mind state you're at, and that mind state will then tend to continue. It also gives you an idea where you're Rebirth is going to be, because it's going to be related to those similar kind of issues. So you know, but at other times, you may find that if your mind is a bit more developed, you've been doing this for a bit longer period of time, then after you have given up the momentum of the past, all the thoughts that come with you as you move from one place to another one, your mind just becomes peaceful, yeah? And you actually enjoy the peace. You delight in that peace then you know that that actually is your bhava, that is your natural home where you want to go. Yeah, Your mind is leaning towards this natural home that is far more delightful than all those thoughts about the world, which actually are just an energy drain, don't get you anywhere. Uh, much more beautiful. That is why you tend. So now you are moving up that ladder. You can imagine now, as your mind is becoming less and less interest in those things, you are moving towards the more higher, heavenly realms, like maybe the Tusita realm. Tusita realm is the realm of contented beings. Yeah, That's what Tusita means, contented. So you're moving maybe towards that kind of rebirth, yeah, beyond, little, more refined kind of sensuality, where you really value contentment and peace in your life. And then you go even higher up. Yeah, you start to, the mind goes into, uh, you kind of start to enjoy some of the blisses of meditation, some of the happiness and joys of meditation. And then you're moving up even higher up, this samsaric hierarchy. And now you understand your bhava. That is what you're interested in. That's why you like to hang out with the piti, the sukha, and all of those qualities. And you are attracted to that. You lean towards that and you understand how to get back to that because you have become an experienced meditator or whatever. So see where it is that your mind inclines. That gives you an idea where your real interest is, what your real bhava is, what is your existence. And that is what you will incline towards when you eventually die. 
Your interest is where your mind will incline towards when you also pass away. Yeah? So, this give, so th for that reason, uh, this is what then will continue when you get reborn, and how bhava then gives rise to rebirth in the future. Uh, the mind always continuing on the same level. Uh, the level you are now is the level you will continue in your next life. Quite obvious in a sense, yeah, that it will have to be, because why should it make a jump just because you get reborn? These levels are related to each other. Uh. <coughs> so let's come back again to the definitions on uh, uh, page 38. So after the definition of grasping, uh, the Buddha talks about what is bhava, what is existence, what is continued existence. Uh, and he says there are th these three states, yeah, or levels perhaps of existence. Uh, existence in the sensual realm, uh, the realm of the luminous form. Okay, that's interesting, luminous form. This is rupa bhava. And the formless realm, this is called continuous existence. So three types of existence, yeah, kama bhava, rupa bhava and arupa bhava. And these uh, relate to uh, the, the uh, realm of luminous form is basically the equivalent to the four jhanas, uh, and the formless realm is the four arupa attainments, uh, and then the rest, all of the rest is part of the sensual realm, from the very coarsest, meanest, terrible uh, existence, uh, and to the very most refined in the Paranimitta Vasavati, that whole spectrum yeah, is part of that sensual realm. It's incredibly broad. And uh, of course, uh, some of the higher realms in the sensual realm are actually getting close to the fully pure minds. So they're quite beautiful. Whereas some of the darker sensual realms are really, really painful and, and uh, horrible. Uh, so there's a very great variety in that sensual realm. Uh, so these are the three states, and it's, it can be subdivided enormously. Uh, but all of these are the existences that you can then acquire, yeah, depending on the circumstances. Uh, and then from that existence, if you now go to page 37, uh, then you are reborn. Uh, and this is how reborn, rebirth is defined. Uh, and very important again, rebirth is defined as the rebirth. Inception, conception, reincarnation, manifestation of the aggregates, the acquisition of the sense fields of the various sentient beings and the various orders of sentient beings. This is called rebirth. And we have seen this definition before in connection with the first noble truth. And here it is again. And birth, uh, it's really birth here, rebirth, uh, is always defined in this way in the suttas. Yeah? It always means real birth. It doesn't mean some kind of arising of a mental state. <coughs> Very obvious here, conception, manifestation of the aggregates. Obviously, we are talking about real rebirth, not anything else. And when you are reborn, what can you expect? Well, when you're reborn, you can expect trouble. Yeah? Trouble is old age and death. What is old age and death and all the suffering that comes with that? Well, old age is defined as follows. Old age, decrep decrepitude, broken teeth, grey hair, wrinkly skin, diminished vitality and the failing faculties of various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. And as I, this is called old age. And as I pointed out before, uh, mind moments, they don't have wrinkly skin or grey hair. So this, maybe they, maybe they do, maybe I'm just mistaken about that, but I don't think so. So very, this also obviously refers to ordinary uh, old age. Death, passing away, perishing, disintegration, demise, mortality, death, disease, the breaking up of the aggregates, the laying to rest of the corpse of the various sentient beings and the various orders of sentient beings. This is called death. Such is old age, age and such is death. This is called old age and death. So obviously all of this refers to uh, rebirth in the real sense of rebirth. It refers to old age and death in the real sense of old age and death. Uh, so uh, there you are. That is uh, uh, dependent origination in a great, in a, in a 
fair bit of detail, yeah, not super duper detail. Uh, we could make it into super duper detail, but then, then it would take much, much longer, and it probably be there comes a point when the uh, return you get for uh, the in invested time goes down. Yeah, even now I'm, I'm wondering whether I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit uh, or how much the return is. Uh, but hopefully you have found it at least somewhat useful what I have been going through. It gives you a rough idea of how this whole thing of craving and illusion and feelings uh, and the building up of this existence of ours uh, and how all of this kind of then feeds the rebirth process and how it all works together. So I hope you can make some uh, sense out of that uh, and uh, make that work for you. Please feel free to ask questions. We will have a Q&A session in about half an hour or so, uh, and then we can maybe talk about this in more detail. It's a good thing that we have these uh, Q&A sessions that we can uh, clarify things a little bit. Uh, and then uh, uh, tomorrow we are going to look at a few aspects of this dependent origination in a lot more detail. Uh, I'm going to look at a very interesting sutta called the Kachanagota Sutta, which is actually very profound. Uh, and then we will start to look at, uh, at, uh, at a few other things, the Avidja Suttas and then the, uh, the, the cessation sequence and, and all of that. Uh, and then uh, yeah, we will see where that gets us. But it's all, uh, hopefully, we will uh, 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 see much more details of this as we go along and make it more practical. That's the point of this. So anyway, have a good cup of tea and then we'll see you back at a quarter past four here. Yeah.